in keeping with the kickoff for the year, we had an article at the last minute, and the sermon today is given by me, and let us pray. Oh God, we humbly ask the peace of Christ might rule in our hearts, that you would silence in our hearts any voice but your own, so that hearing your word, we might also come to obey your will. For this we ask, for the sake of Christ our Lord. Amen. Sometimes you riff on a theme, and our theme in this sermon is forgiveness. It seemed appropriate to tell a story about football today, as the Bengals kick off in a few hours. Strong right, 46 power, the quarterback calmly said in the huddle, ready, great. The rest of the team clapped like they had done a million times since practice began in early August. The calmness of the moment does not tell the story. See, the story is his fourth down. There are two yards to go. The ball is on the 36-yard line. There's less than three minutes to play in the state high school football playoffs. The quarterback gets to the line and marks out the call. Down, set, clap. The center snaps. The quarterback turns and the line fires off the quarterback hands the ball to the tailback who follows his lead blocker through the hole. And he's off five yards, 10 yards, 15, 20, 25 yards, touchdown. In my other life, I'm, a, I'm an announcer. If you want to hear me about that, the JV girl soccer game done from there. Um, touchdown, big blue. The scoreboard reads 21 to 20. It's now time for the all-important extra point. The team runs out onto the field. The other team on defense is the powerful McMahon County Cherokees, led by future University of Tennessee All-American and NFL player Shasan Bradley. Name dropping, look him up. <laughs> now for the all-important extra point to tie it up to possibly send the game into overtime. The snapper gets over the ball. He snaps. The ball's flying through the air. The kicker is ready, taking his steps. The holder can't reach the ball. The ball sails over the holder's head. The kicker turns and runs and falls on it, and it's over. All the Big Blue can do is hope for a miracle. The clock runs down, McMinn County wins and goes on to the next round of the playoffs. Needless to say, the long snapper is distraught, heartbroken. And the team does what a team is supposed to do in that moment. They rally around him, they forgive him, they do all the things you're supposed to do. Forgive. After all, he was doing his best, it just didn't work that time. Forgiveness is not always that easy, though, is it? Is there ever, ever been something that's too big to forgive? Murder? Marital infidelity? Extortion? Embezzling from business? Why can't we forgive those things? Forgiveness. In situations like these, it seems impossible. The covenant of marriage broken the covenant of life broken by taking another life, by 
extorting money from people that you trust or trust you and embezzling from your business, is forgiveness ever possible? As we wake up tomorrow morning, we can't help but remember 22 years ago, September the 11th. Always be the day that America was attacked, a day we, we were alive, we'll never forget. I remember quite well listening to the radio in my office in Tennessee, getting ready to go to a meeting of preachers in another town nearby. When the story was broken that a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center, and they didn't have any details. I thought it was just some sort of sightseeing plane or maybe a private plane that had gone off course. So I went about my day, got in the car, started driving to the next town over for this meeting when another announcement that another plane hit the other tower. Can we ever forgive? Somehow we've come through it 22 years later, or maybe we haven't. Maybe we've grown stronger as a people, or maybe we're more divided than ever. We're certainly more vigilant. We're more angry. And yet we're told to forgive. But how? How do we forgive this? We might be able to forgive someone who snaps the ball over the holder's head. We might be able to forgive the small white lie, but how do you forgive this? Forgiveness. The gospel story talks about take someone with you and go in private and try to settle the situation. What if it's bigger than that? Is forgiveness ever possible when the damage is so deep and hurtful? 2,000 years ago, Jesus was teaching his followers about what it means to follow him and about how to have relationships. And one of the biggest parts of it all, the children talked about it, was love that binds together. And the next step of love is forgiveness. Can we forgive? The rabbis taught observant Jews that to forgive another Jew who wronged them, they had to do it three times. And only then they were off the hook. So we make it into a mathematical equation. I forgive, I forgive, I forgive, done. But did we really forgive? The tradition said three times, you don't have to go four. And then Jesus up the ante and said, 70 times seven. But if we follow the math, is it really forgiving if it becomes a rote ordeal? So Jesus says, don't put limits on your forgiveness. Because God did not put limits on God's forgiveness of you and of me. God isn't keeping score. Why are we? Because we keep score of every transgression of every wrong. We measure our mercy. I'm not going to let her get away with that. I'm going to make sure that he suffers more than me. Jesus says, forgive. And time and time again, Jesus emphasized how forgiveness was essential. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. When someone strikes you on the cheek, turn to them the other. Jesus, how? Okay, we want a formula. Three times, not four. Seven times, 70. Turn the other cheek, but is that really forgiveness? You see, the 
Forgiveness Jesus is talking about is not a formula. It's not a way to solve everything where three times, seven times, 70 times, seven, and all is well. Actually, what he's getting at is forgiveness is messy. And the kind of forgiveness Jesus talks about can only really come from God. Because if we think about it, we don't want to forgive. We're not built to forgive. We want to hold on for every moment of life to make sure that person gets theirs. Jesus talks about forgiveness as a way of life. It's an act. It's a choice. And each and every one of us needs to be forgiven by God, by others, each and every day. Now you may say, wait a minute, preacher. I don't commit those awful sins. Maybe not. But we still need to be forgiven for little things that eat at our spouse, for little things that make our co-workers angry, for little things that we do that drive one another crazy. Maybe we didn't commit murder, adultery, steal, and embezzle not convicted of a crime, but there's always something that blocks us from full relationship. And so forgiveness is a process. You have to work to forgive, because true forgiveness is not humanly possible. It goes against our nature. We'd much rather keep score than forgive. There's an epitaph in a cemetery in Atlanta in which a woman had inscribed on the tomb of her adulterous husband. It reads, gone but not forgiven. <laughs> it's our kind of epitaph, isn't it? Forever and ever he will be known for his sin. We don't forgive. But if we don't forgive, here's the key. We can't accept forgiveness. God says you have to forgive others so that you may understand what it's like to receive my love, my forgiveness of you. If you really think that forgiveness is not humanly possible, I'll close with this story of Corey Tim Boom. It heard an unbelievable speech by a man in post-World War II Germany as Germany was trying to rebuild after the devastation of the war. The man speaking said that he had come to the point that God had forgiven him for his role as an officer in the German military. And after the speech, he began to greet the audience. And he put out his hand and shake hands with the people. And as he came to Corey, he put out his hand and he says, Sister, God has forgiven me. Corey said that she recognized him, that he was one of the guards in the concentration camp where her sister was murdered. She writes, I could not raise my hand to shake his because in that awful moment I realized who he was and what he did. But something happened. In that very moment I realized also how much God's mercy and God's grace had been extended to me. <coughs> so what I could not do on my own strength God's strength did, and I raised my hand and shook his and forgave him. I don't know how. Call it a God thing. So Jesus is ushering in a new type of forgiveness. It's incongruent with who we are and what we are about. And so he says, where you are gathered two or three, there I am also with my love, my grace, and my mercy. 
So friends, to accept that, we first must forgive one another. And it's hard work. But we go not alone. May it be true in your life and in mine, as God has first forgiven us, may we forgive one another. In Jesus' name, amen.